The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and in this episode, we're going to be tearing down some oldish music players. And what I mean by oldish music players is here I have a 2005 first generation iPod Nano, which I have to admit isn't what I thought it was. Um, I would have thought this was an iPod Mini, but maybe that's my lack of experience. And we've got the second generation Zoom 8. Since we've got it here, uh, we may as well start with the iPod. This does still work, and I'd like to thank Clem for sending this to me. He picked it up somewhere, somehow, and uh, sent it over because he thought I might get a kick out of tearing it apart, which I probably will. Which is only funny because it means it's full of some very interesting selection of music, uh, a lot of which is Austrian. I can't play any of it for YouTube content matching. But rest assured, it is a working iPod Nano. This is the 2 gig model, uh, A1137 is a model, if anybody's interested. And this one hails from 2005. Now, the most interesting thing about this one is I'm kind of surprised it exists because apparently in 2011, all previous version iPod Nanos were recalled for a battery overheating fault. And this one may have been repaired or it may have escaped the recall. Either way, let's get on with trying to get inside it, which may be harder than it sounds. So unlike most things where we start with a screwdriver, this one we need to start with some alternative hardware. And I'll do my best not to damage this, but uh, like most Apple things, they're not necessarily designed for repair and reassembly first. Okay, so once you've got the bottom started, you have to go around the corners understand there's like 16 clips around each edge. Well, no, not each edge, <laughs> eight clips on each edge that have to come off. And uh, since it does work, I'm not particularly nostalgic for Apple products, but it'd be nice not to totally destroy this in the process. All sounds positive. For what is a very, very thin bit of steel, I guess, is it magnetic? No, which doesn't mean it's not steel. It could be polished aluminium, but it could also be uh, certain types of stainless, non-ferro stainless. Interesting, was that little piezo speaker for making the clicking? Because uh, there's a couple of contacts from the back here, um, which would, and clearly have made contact there and there. Now that must be with a speaker where the noise comes out. I don't know why I didn't think that'd be physical. And here, this is where we actually get into some standard parts that I might have a fighting chance of getting out. Some screws. Now, of course, being from 2005, it's got a headphone jack, but it has also got the uh, traditional iPod 30 pin connector, which is a bit weird. You kind of forget how massive that was. And um, the fact that that was on phones as well when they first came out two years after this, you kind of go, wow, was that, that really a thing? Apparently it was. Okay, on the underside, we have a ribbon going to the screen. Looks like I've got to lift up a little ZIF connector type thing. Okay. And bottom we've got another ribbon for the uh, click wheel. Okay, so some little self-adhesive or double-sided tape there just to hold the battery down when it's in position. And yeah, this battery looks comparatively healthy. I've definitely seen photos online based around when this recall happened and these puffed up horrendously. I don't know if that was down to a particular type of charger or anything, but uh, yeah, it did not look healthy. Now, interestingly here, we've got a daughter board. Now, I would very much think, oh look, copyright 2005, putting an age on this. I would definitely think that's gonna be the storage, which is a very good idea because this is gonna be on board storage. But that means all they had to do was change this tiny little daughter board during manufacture to get your different capacities because this was available in two, four, one, two and four gigabyte. And this was two, so this was middle of the road. Let's see if we can encourage that apart again. And these PCBs are so thin, they are actually flexing as I work on them. 
although it's got the connector on it, it looks like it's adhered on the top side of the IC as well. Using that pin layout though, I'm, I'm so sure that that's going to be the storage. There's almost no way it could be anything else, but yeah, these PCBs look like they're half a millimetre multi-layer boards. Just tiny. Trouble is I don't want to damage any traces by wedging something underneath, but kind of need to get under the IC to encourage that off. Don't know if you can hear the glue ripping. Yeah, there we go. Knew it. Yeah, that is a Samsung chip. Very, very likely to be the storage. Uh, I would say that's solid, just a Samsung solid state storage RAM, much like we've seen on a, a few other things. And that's a great little design because like I say, that means you can just replace this board and in theory upgrade or downgrade the storage on board. I wonder if anybody's actually attempted to upgrade this to a higher storage chip. That'd be a great hack. Find out how much the operating system can hold. So here we had port for the storage, um, got the connector at the bottom for the buttons, we've got the connector at the top for the display, and the battery, and all the ICs. Now, three and a half mil jack and the, so that must have been a ground. I think that was touching the back of the click wheel. I wonder if we can encourage any of this apart without destroying it. I've got to say, the, the aesthetic of this, when it was new at least, is very much like the PSP, which I said I absolutely loved. It's got that white plastic backed clear glass, so on the edge you do look like you're looking at a high quality piece of glass. Um, not that I want this, but I'm still tempted to try and polish these up, see how nice I can get them looking, for no other reason than I want to see if I can. Assuming this uh, little flex PCB with the IC on it is... Uh... Yeah, just stuck down. So maybe I can get under the corner around here. Okay, let's touch wheel. Ooh, nice. The uh, little tack switches for forward, back, pause, play, and menu uh, are actually built into the, the multi-layer flex PCB on the back. That's kind of cool. And of course, one in the center for select as well. Screen, how do we think the screen module comes out? That I'm imagining is rather glued in. Okay, and there's a screen module out. So these screens are tiny little low resolution LCD. I think they're 312 horizontally in 176 or something in that ballpark. Uh, so very low resolution, but you know, it's plenty for music and the sort of photos that you are likely to be looking at on this. But yeah, there you go. There is your first generation iPod Nano. And it's cleverly made actually. A very neat, tidy package, and I feel lucky that I've managed to find one, or Clem managed to find one, that has a battery which isn't about this big by now. I don't want to overstate my, <laughs> show my hand here, but these traces on the back of the storage daughter board, that to me looks like, because this is the two gig model, so there was one, two, and the four, uh, and I wonder if the four had a second storage chip on the back. I suspect that's EMMC memory or equivalent of. We'll look that up later. So let's put that to one side and have a go at the Zoom. First thing I've definitely got to talk about is the presentation because this one is boxed and I think it's really beautifully presented. You can disagree with me. Um, I will agree that the Zoom logo was probably a misstep. Um, I couldn't come up with a less identifiable brand if I tried, I don't think. I think it's supposed to be a slightly stylized Z in isometric in 3D. But either way, if you showed me that on its own, I would have virtually no idea what this product was for. But yeah, nice, nice um, presentation. Uh, I'm a little bit confused by the fact that it says Zune 8 gig English hardware, US only black. Does that mean this was only sold in black in the US? Either way, once you uh, open the box up, you have this wonderful patterned paper, which again, I think is supposed to be reminiscent of that logo. Open it up, and here is the Zoom 8 gig player itself. Great little device, very similar form factor to the iPod Nano, or the first gen iPod Nano. Reasonably comparable uh, features. Definitely a lot more weight to it, but just uh, quickly tearing through the box, obviously you get the instructions, quick start. Some rather vintage uh, earbud covers, and um, clearly haven't stood up the test of time quite as well as everything else. Uh, and headphones and charging cable in their own little boxes. It's a great little package, and just to show you the attention to detail that went into this packaging, the edges of these boxes that are in the bottom 
are actually ever so slightly tapered so they can go in and out like that. If they were square, you'd really struggle to pull them out square. At this time, you were already getting lots and lots of mobile phones with micro USB on it. And for a playback device, micro USB, I don't really think was ever an issue. I mean, I had an uh, Creative Zen Touch from about 2004, and that came with a mini USB, and it was absolutely adequate. I could charge it, I could play through it, or I could charge it through a barrel jack. I don't understand why Microsoft came out with the Zune in about the same time period and came up with their own bespoke whacking great big multi-pin connector on the bottom. I can't believe they ever believed they were going to sell enough of these that they were going to be selling all the accessories like you could get for iPods with docks and car connectors and that strikes me slightly naive. I think if this had come with a normal micro or mini USB cable, might have been a bit more understandable. Now this one again does work, but Unfortunately, the battery is well and truly dead on it. I can't even, I can get it to turn on with, oh yeah, sorry, the inside of these boxes is also colored like the box. Wonderful presentation. So yeah, you got this, again, bespoke connector. So again, charging, you've got three and a half mil jack on the bottom. Now the difference is, this is two years younger than the iPod. Now the first generation zooms only came in the large form factor with actual hard drives. This was the first one to come with solid state storage and they came in two, four and eight gig, I believe, or was it four, eight and 16? Either way, larger size than the iPod two years before it, but one of the big selling features of Zoom was its Wi-Fi. Um, and yeah, there was some weird sharing scheme where you could share music locally with your friends a certain number of times, but Although I never owned a Zoom player in its time, what I did have was a Windows phone. And I loved the fact that I could set up playlists on my computer where all my music was stored at the time. When I plugged my phone in at night and started charging it, it would then sync over Wi-Fi so I didn't ever have to plug it in to actually transfer music. And that to me was a great feature that also existed on the Zoom. So if you're interested and you would like a very quick tour of the Zoom UI and UX, please head over to the Element 14 community. I will post a little bit of extra content there. Also, while you're there, why not take the chance to sign up and engage with the rest of our community? You'll find experts, other videos, tutorials, road tests, and more. Head over to element14.com. So this is even tougher than the uh, iPod to get inside. I understand you have to prize this little, I'm not sure if it's actually metallic or it's like a metal foil sticker. But under here, there are a couple of screws. And I don't know how brutal I'm going to have to be to get in there. I don't really want to lose a finger to a Zoom. I feel like that would be an embarrassing story because I'd spend my life explaining to people what a Zoom was before I could tell the story of how I lost my finger. Ooh, tri-wing screws. Didn't see that coming, he says, pulling out his tri-wing screwdriver. Who did Microsoft think they are? Nintendo? There you go, new experience. I've rounded off a tri-wing screw. Now, this little plastic cover actually makes a lot of sense because uh, you've got antenna in this, you've got Wi-Fi. You, you need to have a plastic area to let signal in and out. So I suspect somewhere on the edge of that PCB, we will probably find an antenna. What I don't know is how we're gonna get that screw out. Drill? Got some small drill bits. Just gonna guard it very, very gently. Okay, that actually worked. So you can see the screw are removed and the uh, drilled out screw. Very similar construction in there. Although, look at the size of difference in that battery. Now, I don't remember seeing any detail about what the estimated battery life was on the Zoom when it was brand new. I know the iPod Nano was supposed to get 13 hours on a full charge when new. Oh, no more tri-wing screws. This is gonna end badly, isn't it? Why are Microsoft using tri-wings inside as well? Do they not know the deal? You use a couple on the outside as security screws and then it's Posi or Phillips all the way right in. Bottom edge coming out first. Get a nice long connector, get that out. Ooh, a nice little coax. Runs up the side of the battery to here. Yes, that is an antenna. Knew it. Yeah, a little Wi-Fi chip on the daughterboard. 
Um, yeah, weirdly found that out recently. Uh, you'll find Wi-Fi chips on daughter boards like this one is. You just ever so slightly make out that's a separate PCB um, because it makes certification easier. So you don't have to get your whole device recertified by FCC, do I mean the FCC? And, and other authority bodies because um, you're just using your chip and their Wi-Fi which means you only have to get it certified for um, interference emissions, not the whole um, whole Wi-Fi again. So that's why you will often see Wi-Fi incorporated as daughter boards or similar. Um, how does the battery come out? Okay, so there are definitely adhesive under the battery and I'd rather not, although it's pretty much dead anyway, I'd rather not just, you know, set my house on fire with a battery. So essentially a credit card this one's just a blank rfid card from another project i'm working on but hopefully that gives me enough size reach and not sharp corners i don't really mind if i damage this as well the card i mean <laughs> not the battery I'm definitely trying to avoid damaging the battery wow that was unnecessarily glued in and even using plastic i've still actually perforated that and damaged it so that is very very sketchy um, do not play with lithium polymer batteries they will set fire to you your house and everything you love all those uh snarky comments about apple products being non-repairable not necessarily from me but yeah at the moment the ipod nano is well and truly winning this little battle we've got going on it's just glue everywhere. Even the little ribbon connector to the screen's got glue on the back of it. Ah. Battery again is soldered on, which is just the same as the iPod. Okay, there's the back of the screen assembly. We've got a processor, some RAM, and on the back, that is your eMMC storage again, Hynix modules. So I'm sure if we look those up, there'll be two lots of four gig of uh, solid state storage. So what is left on here? Ah, oh, look, they've actually melted down the posts on the uh, on the touchpad. A nice interface between here and here. That's actually just a, a clicking surface connector. So at least that should, in theory, have been easy to assemble. It wasn't easy to disassemble, but you know, why so much glue? Come on, <sighs> horrible. There you go, there's your play pause button at the front fascia and the back and yeah, little built-in tack switches and a glued-in touchpad. And its own little controller I see on it because obviously that is like a little mouse. Oh, I hadn't made the association just how much like a mouse that really was. You've got two buttons and a touchpad in the middle. If you turn that around, you almost feel like you could use that as a mouse. Honestly, I'm a little disappointed with Microsoft here. The iPod two years older, honestly felt like it had better build quality. It's much more repairable than this was. Just that battery, the amount of glued components. If it was a choice between repairability on the two, the iPod wins hands down. And the fact that you've almost got the potential for upgradability by replacing this little daughter board is kind of cool on its own. I don't know how feasible that is because you might have to reflash it or redo the BIOS, but I'm sure there are, there's somebody out there that's tried it before now. In terms of the features, the functionality, the user experience, I would be all about the Zune. But the trouble is, by the time they came out with the original Zune and all its features, they were too late. Everybody was locked into an ecosystem at that point. Nobody wanted to go re-download all their music and repurchase it from a different store so they could share it by Wi-Fi with all of their friends who had Zune devices. Come on, how many people did you know with Zunes? As personal MP3 players, they were too late on the market to make a significant difference. They had a great UX, but no one wanted to buy the music. They had great features, but no one to share them with. It's such a disappointment, and now I've had one and taken it apart, the construction and the build quality is just disappointing. I, I genuinely expected better. So on that rather disappointing note, I think I'm going to go find somewhere safe to put a slightly mangled lithium polymer battery. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you'd like to find out more, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Actually, before I go, um, I would just like to comment on one thing. I'd like to correct myself from the Dyson robot vacuum cleaner video I did ages ago. 
Um, I don't know if you remember, right at the beginning I made some passing comment about the charging dock uh, with its judicial markers and the fact that it, you could charge from both ends and I sort of dismissed it at that and said that's pretty much it. Actually, I was totally wrong. So it's actually got an RFID coil antenna which sits inside here and takes the power from there, waits for the RFID tag that's on the vacuum cleaner, which I probably dismissed as stock control, waits till it's on here before it charges. Genius idea. Make sure your cat doesn't sit on it and get electrocuted. So you only liven up these two pins to charge the vacuum cleaner when the RFID tag is in place. Great idea. Sorry I didn't spot it sooner. Thanks again. See you next time.